We'll start right on time. Um, I'm going to hear two things, two stories essentially, two uh, different areas. We're going to talk about code coverage with, with DSC resources and Travis is going to speak with, about that. He's on the team, or has been on the team. And I'm going to talk about the, our path to getting code coverage in PowerShell Core. Um, here's our contact information so you can either follow us or find us. We're hard to miss. So please, uh, if you have questions, uh, uh, for me, we're going to split up this presentation in two parts. Travis is going to talk, as I said, about DSC, and then I'll follow up with the uh, uh, PowerShell core code coverage tools that we've built. So I'm going to be talking about uh, PowerShell desired state uh, configuration resources. Specifically, these are an open source software. They're on GitHub. We use AppVair for our continuous integration. And these are PowerShell scripts and class-based. Uh, so it's all script, no compiled code. Um, I'm talking about a project. In our project uh, to do code coverage, the goal was to make it easier to review pull requests uh, so that the reviewers could decide whether a uh, pull request meets our bar. And uh, another goal was to make it easier for contributors to find what code was not covered. Uh, before the change, the results were buried in the, the CI log, um, and the results were not very readable. Um, the reviewer find it difficult to answer the question, did the author cover the code that was changed? And the author would find it difficult to find out what they didn't cover if they, if they provided this. Here's an example of the report. This is literally a screenshot from one of the CI logs. It just gives you um, line numbers, the command, and the function. Um, uh, it was very difficult to go and do anything based on this. Um, so the work that we did, the first thing I did is I updated Pester. It didn't have all the data we needed to generate a good code coverage report. It only had missed lines. To generate a good report, we needed hit lines. Uh, the next thing that we added was a common module to run our tests in the DSC resources. Each resource really had customized code to run the tests. And we have quite a few resources. I don't remember the number off the top of my head. And uh, this included code to detect the code files so that we could automatically configure Pester to do code coverage for most of the resources. Some already had this code, so we uh, added a plugin model so that they could uh, do that. We didn't put this in Pester because this was specific to the DSC resources. Um, then we needed to convert the object that Pester outputs into something that a viewer could use. Uh, I did this work, and we used a JSON format that CodeCov.io uses, mainly because they started working with us and it was easy to produce. Um, we, there was a discussion on Pester whether this should go into Pester or be separate. We decided on a separate module. Uh, mainly because it was a proprietary format for uh, CodeCov.io. Um, also, CodeCov.io didn't integrate with AppVair, uh, so I have worked with them to get some uh, support there. Um, they did the work, but they faced some blocks. I showed them where the documentation was or where AppVair had already told us how to do the APIs and they hadn't documented. I showed them the APIs. Um, so this is what the, we get in a pull request. I'll show an uh, actual pull request later. It actually shows us that this pull request, we got plus 10% uh, code coverage for a pull request. So we would probably take this. So this report is much more actionable. Uh, and this is what if you go and look at a build in the viewer, um, you can see that individual lines are hit. You can see the lines and the numbers in the little green circles indicate how many times a line was hit. Um, so now I'm going to show you uh, some actual um, uh, demonstrations of the viewer. Um, so this is a resource that's trying to meet our high quality uh, resource module. This is what it takes for uh, the PowerShell team to actually go and say we're going to support this module. 
one of the goals is they have to be 70% code coverage. So since we enabled this viewer, they have went from, um, let's look here, about 63%, and now they're um, above our bar, 74%. Uh, and we have a report here that will show us that they're actually meeting that uh, goal. Um, and we started getting this type of request after we made this change, where people are actually coming in and saying, we just want to increase code coverage to, to meet these goals. Um, and this will have this type of report here. They increased the report. Um, they increased code coverage. It tells us how many misses they removed and how many hits they increased. Uh, so they, add, they not only added tests, but they added some code too. Uh, they, as they were adding tests, they found some bugs in the product. Uh, or, yeah, the product. Um, and this one uh, is a little more interesting for another reason. The, we actually accepted this one when they decreased code coverage. And here you can drill in to the view and you can actually see a diff. This is a little more complex view. This is a diff of the code they actually submitted. The light green lines indicate it's code they added. The light red indicates it's code they removed. The dark red indicates misses. We accepted this code anyway. On analysis, we found it's code that our CI system cannot run. It's nano server code. Uh, so they can't cover this code. Uh, but previously, we, we had difficulty making these kinds of determinations. Um, and one more. And let's see what this is. The links to these are all in the slides. We'll find some way of publishing the slides. Um, oh, yeah. Um, and this is a view of just the code. You can go to uh, the site, and uh, if you view here, uh, sorry, I clicked something. Okay. Excuse me. The, um, the uh, set here is not covered. In the previous report, this would have been a list of lines. And it would not have been clear that the set target is just completely not covered. But here you can view the coverage and see that set is not covered at all. And now we know we need to go and cover this uh, thing. I'm sure there's some action taken or that we intend to take. Um, are there questions before we end? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do we get started with this? Like, so if we're writing a, a, a new module, mm -hmm. how do we uh, the resources, I put it at the end of the slides. There's a link to the module where um, I produce the JSON. Uh, you can look at that, and it should be fairly obvious how to upload to uh, if you're using Aave. Or if you're using something else, it'll be a little more complicated. You have to use a token to authenticate. Uh, in AppVayor, if you're running an AppVayor public project, you don't have to use a token to authenticate, and that's all we currently support in our module. Any other questions? Uh, if you have any questions on authenticating with a token, I can, of course, help it being, being me. Uh, I'd love to add that support to the module. It's just not needed where we are. That's what Pastor you're talking about? Um, in AppVayor, um, oh. with, um, um, uh, in, a, in a public AppVayor, all of ours are public. So when we're running an AppVayor, they can detect where we're running and authenticate us that way. That's the support from codecov.io for AppVayor that I was talking about. Any other questions? Okay. So we're on. I'm going to talk a little bit about the path that we took to get to code coverage on uh, Open PowerShell. There's a next slide there uh, you talked about. So um, you all, I hope you all know that PowerShell Core is an open source project, right? Everybody knows that. Yes, please. You're okay. Good, good, good. We actually use AppVayor and Travis CI for our uh, CI system. That actually 
had some implications for us with regard to code coverage to talk about. And what we wanted to do, what our goals were with code coverage was actually measure and publish the coverage uh, as part of the release criteria. It's interesting to note that when we started the open, uh, open PowerShell project, we had essentially no tests. We had some tests, but not very many of them. And so if you were to look at the amount of code coverage that we would be able to say how much of our test code is actually, how much of the product are we actually testing with our tests, it was, well, we didn't measure it, so I, I can't say exactly, but I'm going to guess it was probably less than 10% initially. Now, remember, I've talked a lot about our testing uh, processes in the past. Microsoft Full PowerShell had 100,000 tests, but they were all in a, fr in a framework that we really couldn't use in this open source environment. So we had a huge compendium of tests that we couldn't run. Our code coverage, generally using the tools that we used as part of the Microsoft build process was up in the 70s, high 70s, maybe it was 80% at one point. Uh, so we had a, we've had a history of doing a lot of code coverage, and when we started the core project, we didn't really have the same set of tools and we hadn't built it up over time. So we were really at a deficit, not only of, of uh, the test tools themselves, the, the testing themselves, the test code itself, but even being able to measure uh, what, we, what we were releasing, so measuring the quality of it. We wanted to provide this coverage, so we want to measure this on a daily basis. Every time, every night, we do a, day, a build of all of the of all of the C, of all the merges that we've done, and we have uh, and we run all of our tests in CI, and in fact, on a nightly basis, we run all of the tests that we have. So we have some tests that are categorized as part of the CI system, which run in about ten minutes. But we have another uh, couple of thousand tests that are not part of the CI system, the the daily um, part of the. CI system, but but we are using AppVair and Travis to run more tests, stealing their CI system to run not what we would call CI tests, but more feature tests and scenario tests and tests that have a lot of white space in them, tests that have a lot of time, that take a lot of time. So we're running those on a daily basis against every, every night. But we also need to provide a tool where guys who are providing test, providing code and hopefully tests as part of PowerShell Core, that they can easily determine the code coverage that they are providing, the additional code coverage that they are providing, or when they're looking at the code that they're creating and they would like to get this code as part of the product, either a bug fix or a new feature, we want to be able to enable them to determine what uh, their code coverage is because they're going to build tests otherwise we won't take the PR at all. So in order for you to run to get as a developer to get coverage data you need to be able to run the coverage tools and seeing on a daily basis that may or may not include your PR is probably not going to help you very much. So we needed to do a couple of things. We needed to make sure that it was easier for you to generate your own coverage data and try to inculcate that process as part of the development process, making sure that you're getting that data all the time. So from a perspective of what the work was, we were essentially in Greenfield. Where I remember that our environment is .NET Core, CoreFX. And so the first thing that we had to do was go hunt up code coverage tools. And as it turns out, I found three. Now, if you're familiar with .NET, full .NET uh, core coverage tools, there's actually quite a few. There's a number of them, and there's uh, uh, there's a, a, a package product that you can purchase. Name slips my mind at the moment. Um, JetBrains. JetBrains has a package product you can purchase that does code coverage on PowerShell uh, on sorry on full CLR. They actually were coming out, when we were doing this investigation, they were coming out with a package product for uh, Core, .NET Core. And we f I found Open Cover as well as uh, an open, open project. And then I found a host of, of progeny of Open Cover. Think guys that had taken open cover, open cover and added little bits and pieces to it and essentially muddied the water because they all looked like code coverage on their own, but they're at the end of the day, they were all using open cover. And I found one more uh, code coverage tool uh, in, in open source 
I don't remember the name, uh, was not going to be suitable for us. It required um, the original uh, uh, open uh, .NET framework. Uh, I can't even remember the name of it. Um, anyway, it was not going to be useful for us because it wasn't suitable for the core effects. Okay, that's great. I found one for Windows. Okay, let me go looking one for one on Linux. I looked, and I looked, and then I contacted the, the CoreFX guys and said, hey guys, how do I get, uh, how do I get core, uh, code coverage on uh, Linux, on, on your other platforms? Oh, sorry, you can't do that. You, you might be able to write some stuff and hook in the event, the .NET events and write your own and, and I said, no, thanks. So I, there was, there's just no solution right now uh, on non-Windows platforms. So it wound up having to compromise. I don't really can't measure the core, the, conf, the coverage on uh, non-Windows platforms. So I'm hoping that it's pretty good. It's got to be at least as it's got to be. If we're running the same tests, it's going to be okay. But there's a bunch of tests that we run on Windows that we don't run on Linux that cover Windows platform specific behavior. And there's some Linux behavior that we run that doesn't run on Windows. It's core to the non-Windows platform. So I, I'm hoping that our coverage is good there. Eventually, I think I'll be able to find out because I'm sure somebody's going to write code coverage tools for non-Windows platforms. But uh, uh, OpenCover uh, and uh, the JetBrains, they actually use COM to uh, capture some of the uh, 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 some of the things that are going on inside the framework, and as you can well imagine, COM is probably not going to work out so well on Linux, just to, as a guess. So, so we settled on finding uh, finding uh, Open Cover, making sure we learn how it works and make sure it worked with our environment. We had a bunch of changes uh, to our build environment to make sure it worked because uh, we weren't building PDBs that re are portable enough for open cover to use. So we've made a lot of change. We've made some changes in our build process to make sure that we can build a coverage build. So where are we going to run these things? So the first thing we do is we find out, can we run these in CI? That would be awesome. We could run it every night just like our regular builds. It took four hours to run the first first code coverage run. Now there's a bunch of limitations on how much time you can use and, and it wouldn't be very nice for us to say, oh and by the way up there we're going to steal a bunch of your systems for four hours at a time so you want to know those other builds they'll have to wait. So we we didn't even actually ever try to run uh, the code coverage tools in in app there because we just didn't want to be that sort of a citizen. So that means that what we have to find another place to do it. Well initially I did it on my desktop probably not really good for other people to use. So we wound up building up ourselves a VM in Azure. And we uh, are using some Azure functions in order to kick some things off. And we have a bunch of scheduled tasks that run our scheduled, uh, that run the code coverage numbers so we can collect that every day. And then I talked about how much work we wanted to do in the, to improve the developer experience, and we're going to talk about that in a bit. We wrote an entire module called Open Cover. It's an Open Cover module in the tools, uh, in the test tools directory, in, in, the, in the GitHub repository under PowerShell, uh, in the PowerShell repository, test tools Open Cover is a directory that contains the Open Cover module, which we'll, I'll show you in a little bit. So as I said, we settled on a VM. There's a lot of work still to do there. Uh, right now, the VM is always just spinning in space. Uh, so we're wasting a lot of time. It takes four hours or so to run, so we're, we're, we've got more work to do in, in scheduling a time where we spin up the VM, wait for it to spin up, install everything, run our tests, and spin the VM down. That's still work we're going to do, we want to do, so we can be a little bit more frugal with the Azure resources, because we pay for those too. Uh, what the automated execution does, grabs the latest daily build, it installs the tests, it actually it builds the tests because there's part of those things it does. Uh, you have to build some of the, the test code in order to run it. It executes the tests and then we actually upload our results to coveralls. We chose coveralls. We looked at code cover IO and we looked at coveralls and there were features that we liked about both. 
we chose uh, coveralls for one uh, piece of um, visualization that we're going to, I think I'm showing to you on the next slide. And then I, as I told you, I, we built this open cover module that, that essentially evens out the um, execution of, of open cover. In our environment, we run tests as the user, and we, we have to run tests in an elevated context. So it gets kind of complicated in the way we have to build up our, our data. We have, to, we have to execute tests in the current administrator context, and then we execute tests again with special flags to pester that puts us in a lower uh, uh, authority uh, context. So here's here's the reason why we chose uh, why we chose uh, open cover. This this allows us um, this allows us to track coverage over time, very nicely. In fact, um, let's go there. So we can we can quickly see what's going on from a perspective of over time. You can see all the way back to October and some dips there. I'll tell you about those if you really want to know where our tests didn't run, but we uploaded the data. Um, and this tells us where we are with regard to code coverage. It looks like something I need to investigate right now is that we've had a drop from about 46% to about 39%. I don't know what's going on there, but I'll find out soon. Uh, but this is, this is one of the reasons why we snap to, code, uh, to coveralls is that it gives us a kind of a nice, uh, a nice view over time of what's going on. You do have the, uh, uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, coveralls? How many of you are doing code coverage at all? Oh, good. How many of you care? Come on, there we go. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so code cover, uh, cover, coveralls allows us to, to kind of have a nice view of it over time. And, and if I'm paying attention to this kind of on a daily basis, I can kind of catch places where we may have some test uh, framework problems or we may have some uh, uh, new functionality that's gone in that we're actually not covering. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, please don't hesitate. Just raise your hand and, uh, or shout out or say, yo, uh, what's going on? Uh, code, uh, coveralls has the same sort of functionality as, um, as, as uh, CodeCov, where you can actually kind of dip into the, the data that you're seeing uh, and look more closely at what's being hit and what's being, what's being missed. And so this is a lot, allows you to, to, kind of, uh, to kind of see that. So from a, co from a visualization perspective, it's still very, it's very useful. It's a, from a navigational perspective, finding this thing might be a little tricky sometimes. So, uh, 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 but you can find it if you want to know where you're missing things and that can kind of help target your investigations or improvements if you want to do that. So if I talk about the developer experience, the thing that, I was using and what most people would use when they're going to go off and develop, you know, create new functionality and try to close test gaps, which I've, I've asked for help, for help on. I wanted to make sure that one, you could find open cover. It's kind of a, it's some heavy lifting there. So we made it easier to go and find the latest open cover and uh, install it for you. So if you go and type, you import the module, you type install open cover, you find it, it installs it, it's ready to go. Rather than you doing all of the, well, where do I go, GitHub, release, blah, 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 blah. So we wanted to make sure that that was easy, easier. In, invoking open cover is something that we spend a lot of time on because the parameters, if you've never looked at open cover, the parameters are uh, um, comprehensive. It does an awful lot. You can do an awful lot with it in there. Uh, and, and getting the quoting exactly right is also kind of problematic. So it, it, it is, it is, uh, it is uh, pretty raw from a perspective of, of, of the interface to it. So we wanted to make sure that you could, you know, get, improve your consistency with uh, how you execute, how you execute, how you gather this data. And so we provided that. And you can even do a partial run with this. So if you have worked on a single test, if you've worked on a single test file, for example, you can do a run, get the code from that, get the coverage report from that single file, that single class, in fact, and then implement your tests, run it again, 
and uh, collect that data. And so it's pretty, you don't have to spend four hours. And by the way, part of my demo is not to run our code coverage because I don't think we have the four hours to, to wait for it, right? So I've done a, a little bit of pre-canning and I'll show you how it can be, how it can be done very easily. And then OpenCover has a report generator, which is another, which is a, a, a separate module that you can install through install package. And then we've written a couple of command line tools. So instead of using the graphical visualization using a web page, you can actually look at the coverage for your, uh, f uh, f for your run at the command line. So if you want a table or a list or what have you, you can actually do that. It's pretty useful. You can get it on the assembly level or at the class level. So if you have a class that you want to, to determine your co coverage improvement, you can actually get to it. And it measures uh, the, what uh, OpenCover does is it ma measures uh, branches, how, how many branches are covered, and what they call sequence, which is what I would call a line. So they, they, uh, the line coverage is called sequence in OpenCover nomenclature. And then the last thing that I, we wanted to make sure you could do is easily compare one run from another. If you want to do that, sometimes you'd have to have two web pages and look and say, okay, that's all green and that's got red in it. What am I missing? Okay. So we wanted to make that kind of a little bit quicker for you to determine the per, from a percentage perspective at least, how, much, how well you've, how well you've things, imp, things have improved. Everything's clear so far? So here's the, the, the open cover reporting. This is a, a, uh, there's, a mod, there's a package called Report Generator that is built for open cover. It takes the XML file, which is created by the open cover test run and provides you this view of, <coughs> of the run. In this particular case, uh, I actually, uh, it's really poor because it was a single test that I was executing. But remember that when we run a test, all of Pester's running. All of the framework is running. So we're co collecting a lot, of a lot of data that would not necessarily be caught by, uh, by uh, um, if it was more targeted. So one of the problems with that is that it's very, it's not possible easily without instrumenting the source code to capture the test itself because remember, it's a pester test, which means if you're executing a pester test, the first thing that happens is you're loading the parser. You're parsing the script. So you, if you were to try to turn on just the assertion, that just a little bit of the assertion, you'd have to inject an instantaneous place where you want to collect the coverage data from the middle of a script block, which is executing, take a snapshot in time, then, this, then that assertion ends, take a snapshot in time. So you'd need to not only instrument pester, but you'd need to instrument the code that says, don't capture data right now. Wait until this very instant uh, when you want to actually do the test. So that's not a great explanation, but essentially what happens is we can't distinguish in the midst of running a pester test, what's a test and what's part of pester. So that gets captured as part of the code coverage itself. So there's a bit of inference that you have to do, hey, is this test actually looking at, at am I, is this data coming from Pester or is this data more targeted? So there's nothing that we can do about that. It's not the same as if you were writing X unit tests, for example. X unit tests, they're pretty atomic operations, but capturing coverage in, as part of running a Pester test encapsulates all of the function, all of the, the language and the AST generation and all of that gets captured as part of this. So we get a little bit more coverage reporting than, than what, we're just, what we're just executing in the test because of the nature of running all that the code that we're running when we're actually running the test rather than for, like I said, X unit, which is here's your three lines of C sharp that you're running, you get an assertion and you're done. We're running quite a lot more code than that. So does that, that means the answer is just a little inflated? Well, they, we're still executing code in there. And so if there's a fault somewhere, the likelihood that there's a fault would cause the test to fail as well. 
and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about probabilities, not absolutes. So if you're running all that code and Pester gives you the right answer, it says, Pester finally says, yeah, here's the answer that you should have gotten. You probably wouldn't have gotten there if there was an error earlier in the script, which means there was some other fault somewhere else in the, in the engine. So the, an the, the answer is, factually, is yes, it's a little inflated, but that inflation is in some ways uh, a, a good inflation because we are actually executing all that code in the places, you know, in the engine and the AST generator and the AST uh, uh, and, the, and all of the language, we're actually executing all of that code. And the assertion is that if there is a problem in anywhere of that pipeline up to the assertion, that the actual test that I'm running, it was a problem that the code didn't work, I'd get an error and the test wouldn't pass. So one of the things you have to validate is, did the test pass when you're running the pester test. And, uh, and in fact, early on, we were getting inflated numbers. And when we fixed test code, we actually numbers went down because we weren't hitting error conditions in the engine. So in some ways, we were getting more coverage than we should have gotten because of that. And we fixing our code reduced the coverage that we got, which pointed to a problem. And we, hey, we need to write more test code to test those error conditions. Uh, and it has, um, and so now uh, I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about is, uh, I'm going to show a couple of the demos that I've been working on here. So um, this um, is, uh, I wrote a test, uh, in fact, it's the get date test. And if I talk about the assembly coverage, that's the assembly coverage. And I found a bug earlier today. Uh, there's, a, there's a bug in the open cover module I have to fix. Uh, it's why we're double reporting. Um, so I apologize for that bug. I didn't get a chance to fix that before this demo. We're double reporting uh, in some cases. This is the numbers that you would get if you were looking at the, uh, at the uh, uh, open cover or the coveralls or whatever the, on, the, on, on the per assembly perspective. And I'll just kind of uh, uh, go through and just highlight one of those. So you can see I'm not running a lot of tests in there because I'm not actually running any tests in there. It's, I'm just running the get date utility. That's all this test represents. Uh, but you'll see that there's a whole bunch of stuff we do get coverage on. So like system management automation. So there's a lot of code that actually gets executed when I run the get date command. That's kind of a good thing, right? It means I have some higher confidence that if I run get date, there's a lot of the engine that's actually going to be working. And that's nice to know. <clears throat> it's also it's also something you should that could, could be easily said that you know if the engine's really broken I'm not going to be able to run any tests anyway so there's certain validation here that I want to get get a hold of I can also find let's see I think I've got it so I I also told you about this uh, uh, comparison. So in this particular case, I had two runs. I captured the run first before I made changes to get date test and the changes after I made get date test. Uh, if you have suggestions on how to improve the output of this, I'm all ears. This is stuff that Aditi and I just kind of made up that we said, okay, this kind of looks right, okay, whatever. And what you're looking at here is the sequence number represents the latest code coverage number for the get date command class. So at this point, I've written enough tests that I've got 100% code coverage. It also tells me the delta. Previously, I was only getting 87%. So I wrote some more code, more test code. And it was at 87%. And now I'm writing, I wrote new test, and now I'm getting 100% code coverage. Previously, I was getting branch coverage, uh, the, sorry, finally, I got branch coverage 83%. Previously, I was getting branch coverage of 72%. So what this is showing me is that I have a net improvement of 13% for line coverage and 11% for branch coverage. And the final number that I got is the sequence of 100% code coverage in the, uh, in, in the get date command class. So I know I'm 
pretty happy with the coverage that I got. Don't get me started on whether or not that tells me that it's working, because it doesn't do that. I get that part, but, uh, uh, but at least I know that I'm executing all the code that I can execute. Uh, uh, this has a, a direct, um, you can actually view this with the, with the open cover report generator. Here's the, what, from a visual, visualization perspective, this is what open cover produces when it's, when it's providing data to you in a report. And you can see, if I scroll down through there, you can see all the green, and you can see how many times I'm hitting it. Look at that, one time for getting the year. That's interesting. Anyway, going down, down, oh, that all looks good. That looks good, 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 good. Okay, yeah, oh, wait a minute. So when I went looking, I said, where am I, where am I missing code? This helped me point to it. I used the first tool to tell me, do I have a problem? Then I used another tool to kind of say, where should I start to look? Where should I start to look to improve? And this allows me to do that. There is a way, we, and if you're interested, we can implement it. You can get a line-by-line -line report of what's not hit. Open, the open cover, the XML file that's actually being built can tell me this. And so if you would like to see this in the same way that we show it, in, that Pester shows it, we can do that. It's just, it's just a matter of whether, whether we want to do it or not. We can show you the lines that are not being hit. That's not a problem. So as it turns out, I went and saw all these things and said, oh dear, I need to write some more code. So I wrote the code. I actually added the, the test code. I ran the tool again. I took a look at the new, new coverage number, and there we have it. And now it says 100% in the sequence coverage. And if we go down there through all of this, you'll see it's all green. Yay! And there's that one little branch thing that I have to figure out how to get to. I'm not sure yet if I want to get it covered. And so now I've got complete code coverage from a line-by-line -line perspective of, of, the, uh, um, of this command. So I can kind of improve things over time, point, find, find my gaps, go and try to address those gaps and improve things over time. So if you're if you're out there looking at if you're out there looking f at ways to help PowerShell uh, in PowerShell Core improve its its coverage, this is a great way great way to do this. It points to places where we have no tests at all. That's super important to know, right? These places that have no coverage, these places that have these gaps and no coverage, it means we're not executing that code in the PowerShell product. In my mind, that's a problem because we can't really define whether or not it's working right. We assert it's working right, but sadly, you know, you'll put it in production and you'll, you'll find out, oh, it's not working right, right? I'd much rather know that beforehand than afterhand. I'd much rather solve a problem before it exists than after it exists. So we want to make sure that these tools are, you help, help guide you and, and point you in the right places where you can, where you can, uh, in, uh, improve the way we, we do our testing. It's not, about, it's not about showing what we know, it's about illuminating those places where we have gaps. So that's really what this is all about. Here are the resources that, uh, that we've me I mentioned, and Travis mentioned in the, in the uh, presentation. The uh, links you might be able to use, the, everyone is a link here and um, I don't know, there must be a way that these things get published, no? But nobody knows. Okay. Anyway, um, that's it. That's my thing. <laughs> Questions? Yes, please. So one, they're, 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 really, they're really two different aspects of the same topic. Yeah. One is coverage on how do you get, how do you improve, 
how do you illuminate the places where your tests are not covering the code that you've written? The thing that Travis was talking about is about PowerShell script code. The thing that I was talking about is the C sharp code that builds up PowerShell core. So they're complementary. They're not. They're, they don't replace each other. In fact, you can't use Open Cover, the stuff I talked about, to determine whether or not you're covering uh, script code at all. It's all about what's in the. It's all about what's in the assembly. You can't use what Travis was talking about at all to cover what I was talking about. So they're really complementary. They're, they're two sides of a single coin. So as, so as a module author, if I'm writing a binary module, I want to use coveralls with open cover. But if I'm writing a script module, I'm going to use um, code cover. And if you're writing one that's both, you want to use both of them. Okay. And one of the things we haven't figured out yet, which we know we need to do, is a consolidated view. How do we provide a consolidated view of coverage for your module, which includes the assembly and the script modules? And Jim talked about Aditya. Uh, me and Aditya are working on trying to come up with a unified view here. Um, CodeCub.io is probably where we're going to try to come up with a unified view. They're having trouble handling as much data as we produce out of the PowerShell project. Uh, let, so, uh, if, if I may just interject here, the XML file that, code, that uh, OpenCover creates is a 200 megabytes, an XML file. It creates an in-memory object of 1.5 gigabytes. Uh, the code cover, the OpenCover module actually has to build those things up. So if you ever run the OpenCover module and you watch the PowerShell process memory consumption, it'll go <laughs> 1.5 gigabytes, and then I actually throw it all away. But, so. Uh, and to cl I'm really saying the same thing he said, but I'm going to say it in a different way. Uh, there's two tool sets. There's one to produce the code coverage. Um, and in my case, there's Pester. And really, it doesn't have a very good view viewer for it. And in his case, it's open cover that's producing the, uh, the code coverage data. And then you have a viewer. And, and you could use either viewer to view the data. Well, you can't use the one, the report generator that uh, you're saying to... Because it uses XML. Yeah. Um, I could probably write a converter to try to produce that XML, but it's very complex, and it's not needed, and I have, already have a decent viewer. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it's starting to. I guess. I'm just thinking kind of from, from starting with a blank slate, I want, I want to build a new PowerShell module. How do I get, let, let, let's say, a script module for now? What do I need to do to get code yeah. coverage support in my new module? Under the PowerShell, um, can you open the uh, code coverage converter? Yeah. Like, um, yeah. <laughs> really? No, I really want you to go. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, I cannot go to that link. Uh, well, there's the link. Uh, it's under dseresources.test. Uh, oh, my God in heaven. There uh, it is. The dseresources.test. Um, and under there, there's a module, uh, dseresources.codecoverage. And this does the, co the conversion that will get you uh, uh, from Pester into CodeCov.io. Uh, there's a little more you'll need to find in, the, in, in this um, repo. Uh, but this does the bulk of the work. Um, okay. and, um, so it's not just for DSC resources, but just for This part of it does. There's a little bit of, a, of it that does the connection between AppVayer and CodeCov.io. Uh, that's in the rest of the resources, and that's what you'll need to look and figure out what's specific for your module if it's not a DSE resource module. Uh, the rest of it basically configures Pester to do code coverage, and because DSE resource modules have a very specific layout, we're able to find it and figure out what pieces are code and what pieces are not code and configure Pester for code coverage automatically. Uh, but for other modules, that would be more difficult. You're probably going to have to manually configure it. And we're, we're concerned about doing that because we have 30-some-odd 
modules. Yeah, we, uh, we, we, have, we have this problem. Uh, I was focusing on the compiled code first, but we have, we ship a lot of script modules, as you know. We have to, we have to do the same thing for ourselves, so eventually you'll see us be building these tools. Remember, this is all greenfield for us, so we've been building all of this stuff up from scratch over time. You will see more stuff. Yes. The full test suite, yes. Could you speed up some of the tests and containers and just run one PC or one PC or one PC and then kind of add it to the other thing? You could. Uh, it's purportedly, uh, purportedly it, that would work, and the open cover uh, XML is supposed to be combinable. Uh, one of the reasons I think that you're seeing double reporting is because that may not be working quite right. But in the short answer is, ding. Uh, the short answer is yes. You, in theory, it is possible to do that. There's a number of caveats to that. First and foremost being that our tests don't run, all of our tests don't run well in containers. So that's step one, solve that problem. And then there's, the, there's a number of problems that we would need to solve. So short answer is we'd love to get that time to be shorter. How short we can make that, it's not quite clear. Mm, there's another thing is we're, we're also kind of focused on, the, we have this working, we're trying to deliver some features to you before we work on that. We have some balance of prioritization as well. Other questions? Yes, please. We wrote a module that, that open cover is a GitHub project. We wrote a module called, we, and we're calling it open cover, that may not have been a good plan, but we called it open cover, be, but that's what we called it, to ease the way you use it. So in, it, accelerate installation, accelerate an invocation, accelerate report generation, to do all of those things, because again, if you had to, if you had to go learn open cover, it, it's kind of, it's, it's not where we want you to spend your time, right? We want to provide tools to accelerate all of that. So open cover is a, like a library for coveralls? No, uh, those two things are completely separate. Open cover is a tool to generate code coverage data. Okay. And there's open cover, uh, sorry, and coveralls and code cover IO take our, our, uh, our consumers of that data. Correct. That gives you the data. Using the PowerShell module that you wrote. Or you run, run, it, run it manually, yeah. Um, and then you, you upload that? Yes, that's indeed what we're doing now. We're uploading that data into uh, coveralls. And in case of DSC, they're uploading it to CodeCovIO. So, so that's the visualization aspect of it, right? One is the data generation. And then the, other, the second stage, or the last stage, is the, is the uh, visualization place, the visualization process. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in more of this. I, I think I'm just getting confused on all the pieces threw of it. Threw it, at you, it threw it at you very rapidly this afternoon for sure. It would be good for us to provide an uh, architectural diagram of how, how this works. We can do that. Or maybe like a step-by-step -step guide of like how, to, how they integrate, like an integration guide or something. Yeah. I also blogged a few months ago uh, on how to get code coverage data out of PowerShell but I, Core, not modules. Yeah, I think the question is to um, how to do this on your own module. I think I could write something on how to use my stuff on your own module. Uh, I know some members of the community, I've been working on this for a little while. It took a while to get the changes into other components. Uh, so some members of the community noticed me doing that and picked it up and moved prototypes of mine into their own uh, things. So it is possible, but uh, uh, it's been difficult until recently. So what, what part is specific to AppBear specifically? Uh, just uploading. If you don't upload, like when, when we upload in uh, Jim's case, we have to use a token to upload. Uh, to authenticate, saying it's us. When we're uploading an app there, uh, they have some scripts that just grab the environmental data out of app there and authenticate using that. Uh, um. right, that makes sense. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. I'm going to turn this off. You just press it. Okay.